Good evening, Art History 2 students from the bounds of hell and the black paintings that are actually in Goya's home. At the very end of his life, he receded slowly into madness, went into a room, locked himself in this house, and continued to paint things such as this terrifying image of death and madness and monsters. This is Romanticism, 1800 to 1900. Today, we will explore things that we have not seen in art before. We will look at horror. We will look at demented individuals. We will look at the art of the insane inside of an insane asylum. We will look at people that are, are challenged um, with emotional difficulties, as well as mental difficulties. We will look, look at the atrocities of humanity against one another. We will also look at the idea of the objectification of the male and female body. So we start to explore our darker, darker recesses of our mind. This is romanticism. Now, as we look at these, romanticism itself is a revolt against the aristocracy. It's a revolt against neoclassicism and the enlightenment ideas, which talk about people being good and wonderful individuals. In many cases, romantics actually violated this. They believed and they believe that if you gave people rules, unlike the neoclassical who believe you would follow those rules, the romantics believe that people would have to be enforced and forced to compel to actually commit those rules. How many of you, if there was not a police officer around and you knew there was no police officer around, would only go 15 miles an hour in a speed zone, knowing very well you might be able to hit a child? Many of us would go 20, 25, 30 over the speed limit if there was nothing there to enforce. And that's absolutely what the romantics believe. The reason we don't have so many murders is because people are afraid of going to jail for murder, not because they don't want to do it. And that's a conversation for us to have during this time period. They are going to celebrate individual imagination. So it's not always dark and morose. We can have the positive aspects of imagination, though they are the limited side of romanticism. They are going to challenge absolutely the idea of human goodness, that we are just animal creatures that are controlled in some aspect by morality and by the fear of punishment. But really, we are not that great. We have our human nature, our animal instincts, our sex drives, our violent tendencies, just like any other animal. The romantic art that we're going to see is highly sexualized, much more sexualized than what we've seen before, that just hint at sexuality and prostitution. This is forcefully going to put it in your face. And they're going to look at the violence from our subconscious when we let those monsters out. They're going to stress strong emotion, emotions we haven't seen yet, trepidation, awe, and horror. And we're going to celebrate the troubled, tormented hero artist, people like Francisco de Goya, who literally is going insane and losing his mind. And everyone around knows it. But we're going to look at the art that actually shows that. So rather than the idea of the picturesque, we're going to have this concept that emerges during the Romantic period that's called sublime. Feelings of awe mixed with terror, pain, or fear. And this is what evoked the most intense emotions. That comes from Edmund Burke from 1729 to 97. So this idea of awe mixed with terror, pain, or fear. Now, we often think this time period called romantic. It's going to be romantic about love, falling out like Disney princesses. It's not. This is not like the fairy tale endings we see at Disney that have been Disneyfied. This is actually based on the stories from the local romantic language and the true fairy tales that are meant to scare kids into following parents' directions. That's what fairy tales originally were for. Were for. You were afraid of nature because out there, there were bears, there were wolves, there were coyotes. There were things that could actually take you out and kill you. And so we are going to challenge those individuals that have less a possibility of getting away, women who have never been trained in combat, children, and we're going to scare them into staying at home, staying with their family. So just look at some of these terrible endings. If you don't know them, you can always come back and look at this. So let's look at the Grimm's version tale of Snow White. The queen was actually Snow White's own mother. She wanted to eat her lungs and liver as proof of her death. So she actually wanted to imbibe her own child. In the end, she had to dance on a pair of hot red iron shoes, shoes until she died. That's the positive message. This is not the queen mother dying off and Snow White 
literally living happily ever after with the seven dwarfs and, and literally living that lifestyle that she had to, you know, hide. There's other versions of the Grim Fairy Tale of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs where she gets gang raped by the Seven Dwarfs. We're talking about awful, horrific endings that we're going to disney in the modern day world in order to make them palatable for our modern day audiences. Now, this is the greatest century in human, human history for literacy. And right in the middle is a really interesting idea. The only two books over a hundred years old that have never gone out of print. Is anyone able to find what those books are? I'll give you a moment to think through this as we talk about the literacy rate is 95%. That is 95% can read basically at a high school level. Today, that number is somewhere in the upper 60s or lower 70s in any given year. Um, we are relying much more on a visual culture. We're going to have the invention of children's literature, science fiction, crime fiction, lovely things such as Star Wars that are going to show up for my childhood is that science fiction. We're going to create historical novels, and we're going to create the role of fantasy. Thank you, Star Wars. So the only two books over 100 years never to go out of print are? That is correct. One of them is the Holy Bible. So what do you think the other one? It is right here. It's Dracula. What a weird combination. The Bible and Dracula. One about the savior of all humanity, and the other one about a serial killer. Literally eating of humanity. Now, as this is the greatest period in literature, look through these wonderful books. You may know a number of these books, but they form the foundation of much of our modern day movies, storytelling, television, even video game design that shows up. So we can look at everything from The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, War of the Worlds that we see over here, Dracula, The Invisible Man, Time Machine, The Jungle Book done by Disney up here, Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Idols of the King about um, King Arthur, Huckleberry Finn, Treasure Island, Pinocchio. It's ridiculous. And look, we're only 18 years into the century. The Prince and the Pauper, A Doll's House, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Around the World in 80 Days, The Birth of Tragedy by Nietzsche, God is Dead in some capacity, through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland, literally experimenting with drugs and what that can do actually for the experience within it. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea seen down here. War and Peace, Little Women, which was nominated for multiple Academy Awards a few years ago. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Going to the Moon with Jules Verne, Les Mis, Great Expectations. Moby Dick, The Scarlet Letter, The Horror of Edgar Allan Poe is seen up here. The Three Musketeers, A Christmas Carol, The Ugly Duckling, The Raving, Arabian Nights, and later on is going to be the Aladdin. The idea of Charles Darwin's The Voyage of the Beagle as he tries to figure out evolution. And so, and that only takes us to 1839, a remarkable period of literature, and it's the high point in American culture and world culture of actually reading. Now, we do have a challenge that shows up, and this is from Sir Edmund Burke from 1757, the picturesque versus the sublime. And so the picturesque is what we saw largely in neoclassicism. It's what we're going to see later on as well in impressionism. They're beautiful, they're rational landscapes. And then the sublime is almost a metaphysical, a spiritual. It's an artistic greatness that's beyond all possibility, beyond all imitation. And often it adds fear or terror. So if you've ever been to um, a violent storm day or ever seen the beach, on a hurricane or right after a hurricane where the waves are washing up and they're knocking things. You see trees running around. You see this violence that shows up, but it's all inspiring at the power of nature. That's what the sublime is. That's what they're looking at. Versus this picturesque, rational, organized thought of nature. This is very organized, very classical. That's the picturesque. Still absolutely beautiful, but not that terrifying elm that really gets your heart pounding and rushing as you look through a landscape. Now, we wanna compare and contrast the highlight of the Oath of the Haratai from neoclassical period with one of the highlights that shows up from the Romantic period, and that is Raft of the Medusa. The, I, the interesting thing about Jacques-Louis David versus Theodore Jericho, these two artworks are in neighboring rooms in the Louvre. So you get the highlight that shows up of the neoclassical from the Oath of the Haratai, and then by walking out, you could make this comparison almost directly. If you stood in the middle between the two, you literally could do what we are doing now. So what are the similarities and differences? 
All right, we're going to have, for a similarity, we're going to have idealized classical bodies. All right, we're going to have an outside lighting source. But note how different everything else is. The Oath of Arapti, very organized, very classical, very calm. Rasa and Medusa, it's chaotic. There are bodies tumbling over one another. It really is a, an idea of man versus nature, of which is this, one of the first paintings ever. And we're pretty sure from the giant way that's about to hit them right over here that man is going to lose. They're so desperate. And notice, still an off, but a triangular composition. But note, it's not an organized triangular composition anymore. It's kind of chaotic, chaotic, diagonal, leaving off to one side. Even so, that there's a black body on top, which we just have not seen. The apex is a black body, which we have to ask a question, why? We haven't seen that in any other capacity. So when we look at the aesthetics of romanticism, this is what we'll be looking at. We'll use the rat and the do so. It's going to be emotional. They can be various size, from the very small and intimate that gets in your face, that you've got to get right up close to understand the horror, the terror, the sublime, all the way to grandiose scales that fills your face. They're going to use classical forms, at least in terms of bodies, but those classical forms are going to be idealized bodies with very emotional reactions. It's going to use color as the dominant. Really in the aftermath, we're going to be using Rubens versus when we look back at um, the Oath of Herati and neoclassicism, much more on the side of Poussin and uh, the idea of drawing coming out of the Renaissance. We're going to have people living outside of society. We're going to start celebrating those hero artists that are living outside of society. And it's all about a personal reaction to the art, the sublime, the strong emotional reaction. Now, this artwork has a terrible history. So this is called the Raft of the Medusa. When it was hung in the salon in the early 1800s, they could not actually call it the Raft of the Medusa because the Medusa was a real ship. And the ship was catastrophic, as you'll see, so they have to name it just the raft. And that's the name that it went by to later on another political government agency that wasn't implicated in the destruction here was able to recall it and say, yes, this is the raft of Medusa. Here's what happens before they make it on this lovely raft. It's not really a lovely, it's a terrifying experience. The French ministry is going to appoint an inexperienced captain because of his political help to the royalists against Napoleon. So we have an inexperienced captain that has no business at all being the captain. He is told by his crew that he's getting too close to the shoals, these rocky outcroppings off the coast of Africa. But because the wind and everything is well and the water temperature is perfect, he says, no worries, I know what I'm doing. He clearly doesn't. The shoals rip into the, the hull of the ship and the ship starts to sink. They get it off the first time, he learns his lesson, but by that time they're in the shoals, they're trying to get out the sea, he hits another shoal. The ship is going down. There are lifeboats, six of them, enough for 149 people, but that means there's 150 people that still do not, can, can't get on ships. This is 100 years before the Titanic. You think we would have learned our lesson? We did not. We seldom learn from history. So 149 people had to start taking the ship apart, laying on the raft, building a raft, building this so they can float in the water to potentially survive. The people on the raft, the upper class, the upper echelon, remember, there shouldn't be a separation, but there is. The women, the children, and the upper class men start rowing. But man, these poor crew people behind us, they're heavy. I'm tired. Why do I want to do this? So we're going to cut the rope. And we're going to allow those people to float away. We, on the raft, are eventually going to make it to the coast of Africa. And it doesn't dawn on us right away to say, hey, there's 150 poor people that are out there floating in the ocean that need rescue. It takes us a couple of days to actually make that announcement. And therefore, they're just floating off. On day four, the only way these individuals who are caught and have no way of guiding it can survive is they're going to have to start drinking their own urine. On day eight, they're going to have to drink their own blood. And on day 10, they turn to cannibalism. And they have tastings of human flesh. 
Now, none of the people that we can account for that they were eating or tasting were still alive because a human body can generally only survive for three to four days without a water source. You can't drink the water here. It's salt water. It will make you go crazy. It'll cause desalinization and all sorts of other issues. So the people who actually survived, the 15, all were cannibals. On day seven, they had to throw their weapons overboard because they were becoming hallucinatory. And they were worried they were going to kill one another incidentally without really knowing what they're doing. Only 15 survivors out of the 150 ever make it to land. And because dehydration, only five of them ever survive. So here's the question for all of us. Is this a depiction by Jericho? And again, a French individual, romanticism is centered in France. Is this a celebration of human life and existence? Or is this punishing these people as being awful, terrible, horrific beings? And by looking at the picture, what do you think? All right, we have a dynamic triangular composition. And note, it's not straight, you know, we don't have an, an equilateral triangle like we've seen in Da Vinci and other. It very much is off to the right hand. It's pulling you there. And what are they waving at? You look, there's a tiny little dot right there. That's a boat. So these individuals have not given up hope. Note, there's no blood marks. There's no bite marks. There's no sunburn. These individuals were floating basically right beneath the surface of the water. Back, Water's coming over. They're going to be scraped and pulled, and there's going to be open wounds and gashing. And each time they're going to get salt water. Remember how salt water feels when it gets in your eye. It burns, and that's how they're living for days on end, knowing that they're probably going to die, losing hope. And perhaps this individual, rounded with the flag and the sail, perhaps he has actually lost hope as he holds on potentially to a friend or that may be lunch. So in this case, Jericho is depicted kind of heroic survival. He's showing the best case scenario, even for 15 people. But why put the African body at the top? The guy that probably has the least to lose. If they're found, he's probably going to go back into slavery. We are getting right into the age where slavery is allowed and not allowed, depending upon where you are in Europe. And so he has the least to lose, and yet he's the elevated body that they're pushing up, holding the French flag and waving it out. Eventually, these individuals will be discovered by a passing English crater, freighter, and as the English and the French hate one another, they're going to use it as against the propaganda about how bad the French government is. And let's face it, the French government, because they appointed an inexperienced captain, they are to blame. The reason why the black body atop, we believe this is our first depiction of abolitionism. So they are promoting different types of heroes. It doesn't always have to be the white heterosexual male Christian or Jesus that's the hero anymore. Romanticism explores the entire human condition. And so sometimes we might even see a woman as a hero. We might see a Latina or a Latino as a hero. These are all things that are now fair game for artists to explore. Now, as we look at Theodore Jericho and talk about the Wrath of Medusa, he had a tough childhood. He was considered a dunce for not focusing. Today, we'd probably diagnose him and tell him he had, he had ADHD. He'd probably need a little bit of help. He wants to put the moral standards back in history painting, right? From the, from the neoclassical, he wants to keep those in romanticism, whereas many others. And that moral standard is really heroic human survival, but also the idea of this abolition movement. He's fascinated with man's struggle. And he's got a hot temper. He is banned from the Louvre when he's a student, after he hits another student in the Louvre that's in front of a painting that he wants to paint. He has a very controversial affair with this 22-year-old aunt whose uncle is actually supporting him. So uncle is away, aunt and Jericho are going to play. And this is going to give them an illegitimate son given to an orphanage. Now, if you're ever in the very strange feature where you take a time machine back in time, and Jericho says, come over to my studio. 
you may want to think twice. And that is because there was a stench in his studio that he brought in, specifically for this painting and later paintings, where he actually had dissected human body parts, rotting human flesh without ice, so he could get the flesh tones and everything absolutely right within this process. And so it probably would have been a terrifying look at what we are looking at. The figure that seems to almost have given up hope in the Raft of the Medusa is the model for Rodin's thinker. You can see later on in that kind of posture, literally holding the body, almost giving up hope. Maybe that's what he's thinking about. So the thinker potentially could be, and I should mention Rodin is an expressionist, thinking about the emotionality of the situation. It might be not him intellectual thinking like we often think. It might be him thinking about his own emotions, his own life, his own reservations, because it is taken from the Wrath of the Medusa. Now, from modern day studies, we have to ask the question. The question being, if you were in a life and death situation like in the Wrath of the Medusa, how many of you can say you would eat your fellow man? You don't have to kill them. They're already going to die. Any idea what that percentage is that would turn to cannibalism? Because it happens, unfortunately, way more often than we would like to admit. Go ahead. Higher or lower? And so that number is really about 78 to 80 percent, depending upon the culture. The number drops if you consider what? Who won't you eat or can't you eat and you get sick over? Nope, you can eat your wife and your husband, your boyfriend or girlfriend. Ironically, you can eat mom and dad. You can eat your friends. You can eat most of your family members. You can't eat your own children. When we look at the numbers of people that are in that life and death situation and the only food source is their children, they invariably die. And it's only about eight to 10% where So one of every 10 to one of every 12 people is able to survive if their child is the one who dies. So a weird lunch tip, if you are ever in a situation where it's life or death, if you are the parent, it might be better to commit suicide if you're at the end of the ropes because your children will kill you or will eat you and be able to survive, most children. However, you will not be able to eat them and so that becomes a major issue. Everyone dies. Now, this idea of man versus nature, where the waves are about to wallop them and probably knock them over and kill them, has been picked up by the great wave by Hokusai later on. So romantic art impacting impressionist art, or uh, Japanese art, which is going to impact impressionism, man versus nature. We're also going to have the raft by Bill Viola, which is a modern day, um, interpretation of the raft. So I'm going to put myself up in the corner. So this is a contemporary art. One of the leading contemporary visual artists in the world today, his name is Bill Viola. And so he invites people to act out particular scenarios. They are not told specifically what to do, what their acting should be. They're told that they're going to be inundated with water. And he wants to see the reaction that all of them have as if they were at a bus stop where water is going to flow them from a fire hydrant. Note as they pick themselves up and wipe them off, some off in the raft, they are going to assume many of the same positions in the raft as if it's a naturalistic occurrence that's actually taking place. So this is the raft by Bill Viola. And this is what it sounds like. This is a large scale video installation that they have. They know it's coming, they just don't know how fast it's coming.
Now imagine being on that raft during a storm, one where there's no semblance. You know, at least in Bill Viola's raft, there's going to be an end. So you just got to survive immediately. If you're in the Jericho position, you have no idea when a life will get to you. Your only crime then is that you were born poor. Note as we start to see people emerge, who helps who? Note they're going to end up with very similar positions that we're going to see up here in the raft by Jericho. The sense of looping starting to reach out with the hand gestures. It's basically the mirror image of this individual here being supported by this individual here. The body stood, bouncing underneath with the waters at its sides. The individual almost giving up here. As we see over here, as people start to emerge, you know we have that triangular composition and the angular element off to the side here as they emerge. Note the individual absolutely confused again, right here with the gesture of the finger. And so what Bill Viola trying to do is showing the emotional reaction, kind of like what Leonardo da Vinci did in the Last Supper towards tragedy and this life and death situation. Look at the despondence and the dejected nature. Individuals, no, they haven't even started checking on one another yet. They're still trying to figure out their own semblance and where we're called, on where they are. That's why these individuals threw away their weapons. They were worried about what they would do because they were so concentrated with their own experiences. And now they're gonna start looking at each other and helping one another. Literally the idea of hope that we survive or at least that we survive this track. That's what Bill Via Viola is trying to bring in his concept of the raft here. It's a pretty powerful artwork. Now, on the exact opposite, this, this has also inspired a major a musical theater production that's called The Raft that's traveling around. This is also being made now into a movie that is due out in a year and a half because a book just came out about all of the political underpinnings, underpinnings that took place in the raft. So here's the opening of the book, or the opening of the musical, The Raft. So he's one of the survivors on the raft. For 13 days and a night, I have waited for someone to come. Not just for myself, but for everyone else to be saved. Now all hope is gone and we keep living on. What a terrible price to pay. You can see how in the musical they actually have it laid out right here. So this corner over here is the rack. And you're going to have people in the lifeboats are going to be on the other side. I'm going to talk about how horrible their experience was. It's come to this now, I've lost everything that was good in me. You know how he holds the Bible. I'm able to swim through the pain. So here are the people that are on the raft, or off the raft, that actually made it. The wealthy people note their changes, and they're talking about how terrible their experience was. Nothing left I need 
And it took them about two days to make it to school. And so the artwork has, has spawned many different responses as people try to understand the human condition. And that's one of the things that actually comes out within roman romanticism, this idea, this overpowering world of nature that can dominate us. We've all lived through hurricanes here in Miami. So you have that experience of just how powerful a force that happens to be. Now, this would cause many people to have stress. And many of you might feel stress here. It's very common within our um, college community to have uh, feel aspects of stress. And if stress becomes unmanageable, such as anxiety, you may need some help. But here's some potential opportunities for you. A couple things that show up to help manage any stress that you're coming up. One is deep breathing. If you've never learned how to do diaphragmatic breathing, there's numerous YouTube. But basically, it's the idea that um, it's basically a mus muscle relaxer and leads us to things such as yoga, which is one of the best ways of reducing stress, particularly early in the morning. The idea, and that's going to be number three down here, or number two, mindfulness. The idea of exercise, quality sleep. Exercise actually helps you have that quality sleep. Eat healthy. Prioritize. You come up with a list. Not everything you have to do on, that, on a particular day is actually going to be the top priority. Do the things that you must prioritize first and kind of work. You can do positive self-talk. Believe in yourself. Even if you had a bad day, shake that off and let you know, all right, I'm going to do my work today. You know, maybe you need to do the Pomodoro technique and plan out long-term projects. Also set boundaries. You cannot in college or later on say yes to everything. The idea that you can have it all is almost unheard of in American society. And so we want to be the best husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend, the best daughter or son, the best friend, the best student, the best worker, the best for ourselves, have time on our own, the best athlete. You can't do all of those. What is your priority? For I'll be very clear. I feel very bad sometimes about myself. We talked about my depression in the past before because I don't work out. I used to be a college athlete. I have largely prioritized being a fantastic instructor and being the best father I can. Yes, I want to be a great husband. That'd be my next third roll up. But right now, when my kids are young, my two top priorities are work, where I derive a fair amount of kind of not just pleasure, but about my self-identity that I'm this really good teacher and I want to be involved with my students. That's how I see myself. Um, and then as a parent to these two wonderful children that I have. Once my children go off to college, I will probably prioritize and I'm hoping that workout will be on that, but you've got to prioritize what you want. Number nine, laugh at yourself. Not only is it good for stress release, it's actually good and endearing for other people to like you as well. You know, we all make mistakes and the more that you can laugh at yourself, the better. I laugh at myself all the time because I make stupid mistakes all the time. And then engage in healthy habits. You know, um, do something, community service. Um, that's one of the things that I love doing um, is numerous hours of community service every year because I feel more engaged within the community that my life makes a difference, which makes me less stressed within the process. Now, as a weird trans transition in, in terms of what we're looking at, we want to talk about a concept that develops very thoroughly during the Romantic period. Now, we have seen objectification earlier. We've seen it in many earlier societies. But objectification as an overall concept in all of its forms is really going to be a dominant art form, art form and concept during Romanticism. We know we've seen objectification before because we've objectified the black body since the Renaissance or even earlier because we justified having black bodies, which were human, as slaves. And the church actually went through it. In fact, Pope Julius II, the same individual that commissioned the Sistine Chapel, objectified the black body and saying, as long as you're giving him Christianity, you can treat him like a slave or any way because you're giving them Christian message. You're giving them a positive to salvation so you can use his body and his work ethic within that process, even if it's forcefully compelled. We've looked at women as sex objects as well, as you see largely 
in many different things here. But now we're going to objectify everyone. I mean, really, a woman is as nude as a piece of cake after 10 years. So what are the impacts of objectification? Well, I've just mentioned two. The Nazis exterminate 12 million Jews. They call them pigs or rats. We enslave 12 million Africans uh, in the slave trade from Africa to the New World during the 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. The US government committed the largest genocide in, in world history against the Native Americans. Note, this is not even the individuals that were killed from smallpox. This is individuals, for example, Native Americans that we gave smallpox blankets to when we had pregnant women that showed up. Uh, we gave them what other women's blankets that had smallpox. Our government did that about 140 years ago. The US, when we go to war, we don't even acknowledge the lowest estimate of civilian casualties in Iraq or Vietnam or anywhere we are. And that can be oftentimes many times larger than the casualties of war itself, right? That's just called collateral damage. It's the same way. And every country does this, it's not just the United States, but it's uh, as we want to be the, the forefront of human rights bearer in the world, we do need to take responsibility for our own actions and what we've done historically and how we're addressing those. In the United States of America, the women make 78 cents on a dollar making the same job. I'm gonna challenge this number because I don't think this is a fair number um, because that takes place that women take time off of work for oftentimes to raise children for a few years. We actually do all the numbers and look at equivalent time of work. That number is still low, but it's closer to 92 cents on the dollar. So we've made great strides in the last 25 years, but it's clearly not equal. African Americans in the United States, just the cost of being born black for the same job is about $11,000 less a year in the same job. And what strikes me, particularly because I have a daughter who we have to have to deal with these things, is that 82%, 82% of eighth grade girls have been on a diet in the last two years. This is the idea of, of girls looking at models such as Marilyn Monroe and others and realizing that their bodies just don't match up. Of course they're not, they're still developing. And also let's face, Marilyn Monroe's body doesn't match up either. Marilyn Monroe could not get a full model gig. She would actually be a plus size model today. She was a size eight. She was considered the most beautiful woman of the last, of the last century and would have difficulty getting jobs because we've gone so thin. Where did this all start? It started with images like this. So this is the women of Algiers. And so these are women who, these are women, move myself out of the way. You can see that they actually have a hash pipe, a hookah in front of them with the drugs and the poppy, and they are addicted to hash. What has happened with these women is that they were gifts to a sultan, and the sultan would have sex with them one time. If they very much impressed the sultan with their sexual services and or their beauty and what they were able to do, the sultan would keep them on as a concubine. It would periodically visit them, um, really for sexual services, probably never becoming a wife. Even if they became pregnant, they would have a bastard child of the son, which was quite common. The problem is what woman or man, for that matter, is good at sex the first time you had it, right? It's a skill like anything else. You get better with it at over time to learn your partner and committed relationships, but you get better with the practice that you have. So the idea that these women, they're basically throwing away their virginity. And then these women, they don't have another outlet. They can't go back to their families in most cases. So they become prostitutes of the street. They're preyed on then by men and women who basically act as Johns or act as their pimp within the process. And they become drug addicted individuals, many of them ultimately committing suicide in harems all throughout the world. Now, the problem for us, as we think about it in our modern day standpoint, is that this largely was a product of white, wealthy, heterosexual Christian men that were doing really well in the Industrial Revolution and that owned companies or were managers of company, had disposable incomes. So what did they do? They would go on these lovely hunts in other parts of the world and they would kill animals whether that animal happens to be lion hunting here by Delacroix. These are both Delacroix images. So this comes out of the Industrial Revolution. Could be a hippopotamus hunt, could be on a snake hunt. So you would do this during the day, and this is what you would do at night. Without your wife or your children ever knowing, this became part and parcel 
of the birth of Western tourism. Remember, tourism started as spiritual pilgrimages, going to see relics to get time off of purgatory, which is completely fallacious and fictitious. Now we've moved tourism to the sex industry. And sadly, we still have this all over the world as well. Right, there are certain places that you can go, Thailand, you know, Bangkok, the city that never sleeps. We talk about Las Vegas, going there, and what stays or what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. And so in Thailand, there is sexual tourism sites that you can do and go have sex with a 14 or 15 year old boy or girl. Very hard to regulate. And luckily, in the United States, we have started prosecuting those individuals who come back in the United States after this that are American citizens. So this is something we are starting to proactively do something about, but it's very hard to track these individuals. Now, a lot of these images, these images are called odalisks. So it's O-D-A-L-I-S-Q-U-E-S, O-D-A-L-I-S-Q-U-E-S. These odalisks are increasingly going to lose more and more of their clothing. Remember, we are still in the Victorian period in standard. And so when a woman, a wealthy woman, your wife, would show you a little bit of wrist, it would turn you on because you had not seen, or she shows you a little bit of thigh or a little bit of leg. You just haven't seen that before, right? These women are prim and proper. So women basically was showing cleavage and these opening and they're barefoot. It's a very sexually arousing, almost a land that needs to be conquered, save them from their own sins. And that's kind of the idea of the Odalis that show up. So these images are also a product of Orientalism. Us thinking of the Orient, which could be anywhere. And remember, Orient is not actually a region. So it's really look, us looking at the Middle East, which we were calling the Orient. And these women that basically were thrown away by their own culture. And us going and participating in the continually abuse of that culture. So do we didn't start the problem but we absolutely help exacerbate the problem um, and make these women more palatable, at least for a number of years as they're getting abused without trying to figure anything out within the system. And that's one of the problems. So the issue becomes, what do you do with these today? You own one of these, you inherit one from grandpa or great, great, great grandpa. You kind of know what the image, not always, but probably shows that grandpa or great, great, great grandpa somewhere in your family line went out and had a party. When he came back to Europe, he hired one of the most famous artists because he was wealthy or doing very well, like Delacroix, to make this image about women that he had this fantasy, this sexual fantasy about, and now you're gonna hang it on your living room wall. You know this, and so museums today are flooded with these lovely Orientalist um, images of the Odalisque because people are like, I don't really wanna know what grandpa did. And that would make sense because we now know what grandpa did. This is going to lead into this oriental as we talked about. I'm going to put this out of the way for a moment. Basically, we're going to free these people from their sins. And at the same time, it's a culture of pleasure for white men to engage in. We're not up to family tourism anywhere near that yet. That really is a product of the United States in the 1950s, post-World War II. We're not even traveling with our wives in most cases, unless we're very, very wealthy. So this is men going out on the hunts by themselves in their deepest, darkest Africa or in the Middle East on these Oriental images. Now note, there's a long tradition of nudes in art. We've seen that. And we can go back even further than mannerism, but we'll start with mannerism by the Venus of Urbino by Titian. One of the most beautiful images, the elongation of form, that classical beauty. Now here, we know she's a prostitute but it's hidden. And so we know, but we don't know, right? We call her the Venus. So it's the love goddess. So it's okay to stare. No, she does slightly make eye contact, but she's fine to look down a little bit. She covers a little bit of her privates, even though her breasts are showing. They're up here filtering for a place. So she's basically waiting to be dressed over here. She has a nice little dog over here. So the idea of fidelity and marriage, that's not we're looking at the nude beauty of the female flesh. Remember, it's only white men that are going here. Romanticism later on is going to challenge this. One of the artists we're about to see is going to be Goya. And Goya challenges because this is his wife. Nude Maja actually shows up here. And so how odd is it to have your wife pose like that for everyone else to see? This is not just for you as an individual artist. This is for everyone to see. 
Grand Donalisque. Here we still are looking at beauty. No, this woman by Ang actually hides up a little bit. You see the underside of the breast, but she's kind of hiding and even has this oriental kind of feather that she hides up. The next one and the one beyond besides matcha that's going to drive us nuts is in the next time when we look at Olympia by Maine, because here we finally have a prostitute. No, we're slowly moving. These are all images of prostitutes except for the wife, but the wife is posed as a sexually provocative door, basically waiting for her husband to come and make love to her. This is not love. This is pure sex and lust. This is a woman who has a servant that's collecting gifts that basically is waiting to say, next, like you would at a deli counter. And she's confrontational. She doesn't look away. She doesn't tilt her head. She's looking directly at you and says, come on, dude, I got 15 minutes before the next customer comes along. So it's that idea of objectification of the impact of the reclining nude. So we are getting more and more frontally aggressive about the, the depiction, the image of showing prostitutes and what that means for society. These women should be ashamed of themselves, but they're not. We hide them. We talk about the wives on some of them having these passions for her husband. Here we hide a little bit more by showing the back image. And here she's very confrontational in our next part. Image. This objectification has huge impacts. Just look at most recent, some very problematic images. I'll put myself down here then. Here we have Katy Perry, the idea of selling sex at pop chips, clearly fake, nothing fake about them. Really, this is a reference to her breasts, which there was a controversy about itself. This woman, I mean, Dove, what are you thinking? This woman who is African-American, right? Next one up. It's, the image started off like that. She took off her brown shirt as if she had just washed with Dove, and she becomes a white woman. Really, the message being the darker you are, the dirty you are. That's a terrible message. I'm sure that's not what they meant, but you've got to think about what you're doing. There's no way except that Burger King doesn't know that this is an oral sex reference. It'll even, it's, it'll blow your mind away in the modern day world. And finally, what are they thinking? H&M, coolest monkey in the jungle, and they actually have an African-American in the monkey. We've got to have better advertising within the process. Artists, you can't make these mistakes because they can cost your company millions of dollars in customers. Bad press. Now for all of you, and let me look at you while I do this. Please note here, men's and women's full-time earnings by race and by gender. Note, if you look at the white men, white women, AAPI women, Hispanic women, black women, if you look at the difference, in almost every category, the white man makes more. And in the higher salaries, jobs, look, they make significantly more. So when we move to the business field, fields that are dominated by men in every capacity. We, I just said that sometimes the number that now the National Organization for Women gives that women make 78 cents on the dollar. Not really a fair comparison because the 78 cents doesn't look, women and men sometimes are, are, are gender selected but choose different careers in many capacities. And part of that might be what they're encouraged in. You know, if you we do all sorts of studies, with children um, in elementary school. When a reading assignment comes up, the teacher often asks more often than not, girls, young girls, hey, what do you think about this reading? Boys are asked math and science questions. There's all sorts of studies that show this to be the case in every grade level moving up. So of course, boys are, are thought about math and science all the way up, and also about business as well. Women are thought about teaching, psychology, service careers, right? They're more, compatible in that human condition with helping someone out that needs it. We don't evaluate those skills though in the marketplace nearly like we do those harder skills that we talk about um, within the masculine population, of financial leaders and making decisions and firing people and leadership. So one of the things I wanna to talk to you about is the following, look at the differences. Here's another chart that shows that same thing. And I love this one because it says for every $1, you can look how different people fare. An Asian man makes more, but at the same time, those Asian men, they have more education generally than the white guy doing the same kind of form. Most Asian men, and this is true, most Asian men are in either business or computer engineering or doctor. So they generally will have terminal degrees, 
which pays more. If we look at Asian women, generally they have higher education as well, and they're at about 90%. Going all the way down to down here, look at that. Hispanic women, somewhere around 60%, just under 60%. So this becomes one of the ways that we have to help you all learn how you navigate the system. And that is you're going to have to negotiate your salary. You guys, when you first get your job in the arts, unless you're a union faculty or a union where the contract is already based and everyone to make sure that Asian men, Asian women, Native American men, if you're their first year, you all get the same pay. That's what unions do. And they're very good at leveling the playing field along those lines. All sorts of issues for promotion we can talk about later, but there's a fair baseline that shows up. Most companies you apply to will not have this, which means ladies in particular, or individuals that do not look like me, that are not white, male, heterosexual Christians. You're going to have to negotiate your salary because invariably I am going to get offered a higher salary when a non-union faculty, for example, probably than any of you. And so we need you to start negotiating your salary. because so I'm telling you, white guy, I'm gonna negotiate my salary. Let's say they offer me $50,000 a year. And I believe the range is from 30 to 60, or 40 to 60,000. So they put me right in the middle. I think I have a higher range of skills than what they're offering. I will I say, you know, I think I have them. I don't have all of the skills that you're looking for, but you have to agree that I have the most skills of anyone you hired. I think I'm worth $58,000. What do you think? And they can come back to me and they can say no, but most likely they will negotiate a little bit. And so even though I might not get to 58, I'm asking for, I might make it to 54. So that's 4,000 more dollars a year. If I multiply that versus the 40 years I'm going to work, I have just earned 160,000 extra dollars. I've basically just bought a huge down payment or half of my house. I've basically just bought four cars or five nice cars in my life. So we have to negotiate. Men are way more likely to negotiate than, than women, which means that gender pay gap can actually go up with negotiation. But women, you've got to negotiate. The entire reason that I am here in Miami is because my wife didn't negotiate at her first job. No one ever sat us down and no one ever had this conversation. So my wife, after 10 years with a multi-million dollar loan, a track record, hundreds of publications at her former school, she went in and said, hey, she found, or actually, first off, she found out that men that had just graduated, particularly white men that had just graduated with their PhDs, were coming in making the same amount of money as she was after 10 years, 10 years. So she went in to negotiate a fair salary and they told her no, that they weren't gonna negotiate her salary. So we went on a national job search. She found work almost immediately. I mean, really, it's almost like I had to find work in the different cities she was finding work. She found jobs so quickly. So we had a couple different options and we thought Miami was the best option. Miami nearly doubled her salary. Um, because she's kind of a superstar coming in, but she had, we had to learn to negotiate. Now, if you're not a superstar and just really good at your job, you may never catch up on the 4,000 you left behind. And so that's one of the key features. We need you to negotiate. You can always reach out to me. I have students every year that I will help negotiate. And oftentimes we go, sometimes we'll negotiate maybe $500. I've had people that have negotiated more than $20,000 a year in the graphic design field. $20,000 because they lowballed them to begin with. And so you are going to negotiate not out of emotion, but that you match up with more of the skill sets. And then you have already developed the skill sets and any outside skill sets that could be an abstract to the company. That's what you're arguing over. Then whether they want to negotiate back with you, then maybe they say, no, we can't offer you any more money. Could you work at home two days a week? Could you get an extra week of vacation? There are other things that you can actually negotiate besides money. So it doesn't always have to be financial. That can benefit your happiness within a job. So how do we justify paying women 90 cents on the dollar? African-American men, $11,000 less. Latinas, $78, 78 cents on $1. We objectify those bodies. We look at the white male heterosexual Christian as we've through, done throughout history. And we evaluate that as basically the carbon copy and everyone else who does not meet those criteria will oftentimes get evaluated lower through no fault of their own but it's just socialized into our system 
So that's one of the problems that shows up. So we must negotiate. The other artist that we want to deal with and talk about today is darkness behind me. This is going to be Goya. Goya is loves to satirize his own company. He loves to, to paint the evils of his time. And he's really the first artist that paints all the evils of his own time. And he's going to suffer from major depression. As you can see, just look at how morose and saddening and heartbreaking his beautiful images are, but they really do show a very dark side of humanity. Even in terms of this particular artwork, this artwork is called the 3rd of May, and it is one of the best artworks ever. It's a masterwork of linear element, horizontal, diagonal, vertical, implying. If you've never done a linear analysis here, here's how you do one. Linear analysis, the first thing is we're going to have you do a rough drawing of the lines that are going to show up in this particular image, just like the Van Gogh. So if you do a line drawing, and I'll give you a moment to do this, so you can pause, and if it takes you 10 minutes, do it, and then come back. Your linear drawing will something, here's a quick one that I did in about two minutes. So this is the idea of what you can kind of create. Just a quick linear drawing. So we can look at the diagonals, the implied lines, the verticals, the horizontal, so we can do a thorough analysis. And what we cover as we look at these differences is, look at the implied lines. We know this individual, with the diagonal energy, but note he's static at the same time. The bright color, we know he's going to fall down like this in that Christ-like vertical pose. So that energy is about to be extinguished in every capacity. Note, we have this marching back, even though they're at a diagonal for energy, because they're about to shoot. We have this marching diagonal that later on we're going to see, even in terms of Nazi, Nazi troop formation, as they execute Jewish prisoners. So this very calm routine, almost cold blood-like, bloodlust, and the color actually shows that off. The vibrant colors are all on this side, people that are about to be massacred. And here's this cool army force that literally is detached, depressive. The church in the back with their beautiful spires reaching out into the darkness, into the void, there's nothing there. And the most cool thing about this, look at the light here. This is a light box. Note how the light rays come out. Remember, romanticism is a critique of enlightenment. So here we have the enlightened individuals that are about to be mowed down. Remember, enlightenment is all about rights and that the government protects your rights and unalienable human rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, if you have bad people on the other side, they don't care. So that's what the romantics are trying to show us. That enlightenment, wow, you have wonderful principles and wonderful ideas. That's not how humanities work. So this is a brilliant light composition um, as well as a linear composition. The most famous artwork, most likely, out of Goya, may be this. This is Los Caprichos, the disasters of war. And so these are a series of prints that were a condemnation of everything about Spanish society. So he takes on everyone. He takes on the superstitious. He takes on the ignorant and the dumb. He takes on the inabilities of the ruling class, how fraught with difficulty they are. He takes on infidelity and marital mistakes. He takes on the idea that rationality does not make sense, that church is absolutely immoral, and he believed that people were evil by nature, evil in terms of human rights themselves, rather than the goodness that comes out of the neoclassical period, that enlightenment period. Note this image down here, we can tell this is, he's suffering from mental illness. We know that, right? Because look here, the cat isn't bothered at all. The cat's perked up, but probably from the jerking motion as the individual tweaks and, and, and has this nightmarish vision around it, where the cat doesn't see any of these out. We know because the cat's not attacking. This image then is the transitional image right in the middle of Los Caprichos between reason and mankind's imagines monsters and actions. So the first part is all about the enlightenment and the enlightened ideas. And the later is look what happens when we don't actually punish people or when we allow people to their own wiles and to authorize and to protect themselves. And this ultimately is what leads us to the romantic period of these death and acts. So Goya believed irrationality comes from sleep. That's where we turn off our rational. And that's why the owl here flying above him is trying to wake him. Why? So we can get more in the cat realm. Because what we do in the unconscious as we are learning more and more is disastrous. It's evil. It's awful. 
This is where we somehow the sleep of reason, why right? we put reason to bed, we produce our monsters. Later on, a lovely um, artist actually in the contemporary world named Yinka, Y-I-N-K-A, shown a bear. He's a contemporary Yoruba African artist. And he uses the same thing to show the dealing with colonization, where here we have a white guy falling asleep. No, African animal right here, still awake, so we know it's a dream. And then we have these variations, including monsters, and these vampire bats behind. So what do you think the message of Shona Bear's Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters is? That's correct. The white guy, we often talk about the idea is the justification that he knows, knows in his heart that belittling and treating African people like slaves is wrong and it, putting them in indentured servitude. He knows that. I mean, think about the case behind here. He is willing to give his children, who he probably loves, over to an African woman who is going to raise and breastfeed his child. You don't give that kind of access to anyone except you really trust them. And so if you truly think that African and African slaves have the same capacity as a gorilla or as a monkey or as an ape, as they often talked about them back then. Remember, even H&M ad, we looked for identification, coolest monkey in the jungle on the small um, African-American child, which was still problematic in the modern day world. You're not going to give your child over to someone who you don't believe is an ape that's going to raise them, potentially could hurt them, harm them. You give them over because you want the best for your child. Therefore, we know that logically, logically, he knows that it's wrong what he's doing. The indentured servitude, the poverty, they know it, right? That we're going to give them Christianity, but we're going to beat them and make them our slaves, oftentimes raping those women as well. And yet it's the monsters that he knows what he's doing wrong and God's not happy. And that's what Yink is trying to get across. These Los Caprichios, here's a number of different ones that show up. I'm going to shrink my side down so I can show you a couple of them. The Disaster Award. Here's one where they're trying to show the boogeyman. Really, the terrifying notion of the children in this black background. Here, there's a lot of sexual ones that show up. He broke the picture, so he broke the picture. And yet he's blaming the woman probably so he can get sexually gratified by spanking her with a shoe with her bare arms. Plenty to suck, a sexual reference, but really sucking on lemons as other individuals around are the doof, um, the kind of the lower class of society that really have not had an education. And the idea of swallow it all for forcing someone to actually swallow all this stuff, including like all the teachings from the Roman Catholic Church, that you've got to swallow it all. At the end of his life, Goya is going to put himself into this house here. He's 75 years old, he's mentally unstable, and he's going to create the dark paintings, ultimately leaving us with this. The monster that's behind me about to eat me, or eating the man behind him, that I'm fascinated at turning around and looking at. So which image is more terrifying here? These are both the idea of Saturn devouring his children, so Saturn, otherwise, in the Roman or Greek world, would be Kronos. And it's the idea of eating their own children so they don't come back and attack you. So here's the Rubens version, all the way over here. No, a much more realistic, that turpentine flow that shows up. And here we have the monster image. Most people in class generally say it's the monstrous image here that terrifies them the most. The brutality and the eyes just gone haywire. For me, as a parent, this person's already dead, right? The ripping limb from limb, the hen is gone. For me, it's this, where the child is still alive. And you really see the pain and the suffering of the child as the dad actually eats through the flesh right here. More disgusting cannibalism. The black pings are going to include images such as Judith and Homophernes. We're going to have a witch's Sabbath. And we're going to have two men, old men, eating soup. And you can see, they look almost lecherous and looking on. They're clearly up to no good. If we compare the black paintings here, the Judith and Holofernes by Goya over on the left versus the Gentileschi, what are the similarities and differences? All right, so we're going to have that dark foreboding, that almost tenebrism, and that's kind of it. 
Gentileschi depicts the powerful, the action that's taking place. This is more contemplative about, is she going to do it? Because she doesn't appear in the act of gesture right now. She's in the process of thinking about doing it, which might even be more terrifying than more action that we see in the Gentileschi. Now, here is a video trailer of Goya's Ghost Trailer, starring Natalie Portman, Javier, Javier Bandam. Um, not a particularly great movie, but it's an interesting trailer, so you can actually see what they thought of Goya and how they tried to get him for instability in his own life. And he was a very famous that Goya had with one girl. And we're not quite sure if that's accurate or not, but it's an interesting look at the time period, even though it's not a great movie. Now, Goya starts off with what we call the idea of protest art, which we currently still have, contemporary pro protest art. And one of my absolute heroes is this individual here, Polish individual who's now a Harvard professor, an elderly Harvard professor. We've been trying to get him down here at Miami-Dade College for Arts and Letters Days for a little while, just haven't been able to figure out yet. His name is Krzysztof Wodiczko. And what he does is he uses large-scale projections to try to solve the problems of the world. So initially, one of his first projects was the Homeless Victims Project. He gave homeless individuals this, notice it's a shopping cart, it has a projector, and it gave them basically lessons in how to present themselves. And so the projector, he helped them write resumes, and on the resumes, he could actually project the resumes then onto places in New York City like Trump Tower to try to get to hired. Most of the individuals, they got the cart for a week, and most of those individuals got hired by Fortune 500 companies because they were just down on their luck. They needed a little bit of help to get medical supplies, or many of them had mental health issues, or many of them were actually homeless vets that just needed a leg up to actually start off. My favorite project he's done is the Tijuana Projection Project right around 2000, and that is during NAFTA, the North American Free Trade um, Agreement or Arrangement, basically there between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, we had free and open borders, which we still have, where you can send goods. Well, Mexico decided to make sure the shipment of goods worked really, really fast and quickly. There was about a five mile area right on the border of the United States. They stopped enforcing Mexican law in. And so the companies that were there, whether it happened to be Nike, Tommy Hilfiger, Adidas, Puma, um, any of the athletic companies, they would actually enforce their own laws. Well, no surprise, um, women were the abuse, and uh, numerous women were um, either forced into having sex with their managers in order to keep their job, or were forcefully raped, but they weren't allowed off. And so the only people that were working in this little area were male managers and 20 to 30 year old attractive women from Mexico were basically being sexually abused um, and getting paid for the, the money they were working for Nike or for Adidas. And so what he did with the Tijuana projection, is he took their faces and distorted them and told them the horror stories. And then in San Diego, right across, as well as in Tijuana, Mexico, he had a week where these women would tell their stories, basically embarrassing both the United States and the Mexican government, in which case they had to change their laws and they did. And so each of these are large scale um, images and impacts he's had. He also had the gun rights advocate for the Brady Bill, when the Brady Bill got passed where we banned assault rifles in the United States of America. Another one of my favorite artists of all time is William Kentridge. For those of you who like to draw, um, he very much is a South African artist. He's been, he's kind of the elder statesman and he's remarkable. This is a, an animated socio-political cartoon that he did. Um, and he did this one specifically for Miami-Dade College um, and it's been touring around as well. So I'll show you a couple of minutes, but you'll note there's three layers of animation. And so they're not highly detailed, but the whole idea is the story behind it and the impact. So this one has to do on the African to African-American condition in Louisiana, the impacts that slave has had, slave and slavery has had around the planet, particularly in the, the condition of the United States um, and other Western nations. So this is William Kentred's work. Always a video installation like Bill Viola. So you'll know you'll have a drawn background, you'll have a hand washed animation, and then you'll often have a video projection in front that goes around in multiple different experiences at the same time. 
So if you don't know, origination of a jazz funeral is based on African funeral celebrations from around the world. The idea we take the body to his favorite places, we might stop at bars, it can take hours to days to have it. This is very common in jazz communities like in Chicago, but specifically in New Orleans. I'm going to fast forward a little bit so you can see the different variations that show up as people come around with different aspects. You'll notice some will be moving faster than others. You'll have weird tools that pass it that supposedly have something to do with the story or this human condition, and you get to decide and interpret the video installation and what it means. There's very little explanation of it ever. Oftentimes there's an emotional recap that comes in between celebratory versus the sadness. And he's one of the first artists that he is a white South African and the first artist that actually challenged our time as being a racist structure. And that's really where his animation started off at. I'm going to scroll through a little bit without the music then, so you can see what else is coming. You can see we have slowly, we have different musical instruments that are going to come across, including a band. We're going to have a preacher or a politician come across. We're going to have dancing calaveras or skeletons. We're going to have a couple African masks coming for almost like dis disjointed people. We're going to tire moving, and then we have individuals coming through. They have serious as medical conditions that are walking around. And it's your job then to put it all together. You can go back and watch the entire thing if you like. It's about 15 minutes long. But a fantastic artist, an artist that you should know from the to animation um, or kind of how graphic production can be used for the arts. And our last artist then that we want to talk about from the Romantic period basically gets, gives us a new sense and really is where the idea of the sublime, at least in the idea of the natural world, looks like. So this is um, Joseph Millard William Turner, also known as J.M.W. Turner, or just Turner. He's the exceptional creator of moods, light, and drama. He is the forerunner of Impressionism, but showing the power, but also the fear and danger that can show up with gorgeous landscapes. He believes in colored light and atmospheric movement in subjects. And note how his paint brushstrokes basically are Ruben's gone to the next level with turpentine, where there really cannot even be an outline of a form sometimes. His works increasingly look like sketches. At the end of the life, they really do look much more like sketch. And he's starting to study the optical effects of sunsets over water. That's exactly what the Impressionists are going to do. Um, in some capacity, anywhere from, depending upon which artwork we're looking at, 20 to 30 years later. So he absolutely is the forerunner of this beautiful Impressionist experimentation. So our last image that I'm going to have you guys look at today is this. This is Liberty Leading the People in 1830 by Delacroix. So what I'd like you to do is figure out what are the neoclassical and what are the romantic features of this artwork. You should be able to figure out both. And if you worked in the Louvre, which hallway would you hang it in? Because in the Louvre, you could actually hang this. And here's my little guy making a jump. That's actually a real picture a photographer took of him between two benches. Here's the Louvre established by I.M. Pei. That's the, the ancient... Um, um, palace of the French Empire where Napoleon actually used to live and now it actually is the Louvre Museum that you go into right here where the Mona Lisa is and where would you hang this? Does this artwork go in neoclassicism or should it go in the idea of romanticism based upon what you see? If you pause the video you can take a moment and then I will continue. And here's the problem. This particular video you have neoclassical themes but it's romantic style. It's about nationalism. It's about patriotism, right? You have the triangular composition. It's chaotic like romantic style, right? Strange things happen. You have nudity that takes place for no apparent reason. 
a woman who's actually powerful here with the French flag. She reaches up, and at the same time, her breasts show for no apparent reason. But the idea is, where do you hang it? And we ask because this particular artwork has hung in both in the recent past in the Louvre, in both the neoclassical section and the romantic section. Neoclassical section it would have to hang right by the Otho Horatai, which is the major artwork there, really highlighting neoclassicism. Or could you hang it by, excuse me, or hang it by the Wrath of the Medusa in either case. And lastly then, in class we will watch this, but you can watch this on your own. The Carters, lovely Beyonce and Jay-Z here, have created a video called Ape Shit, which was completely filmed in the Louvre. And note the importance of having black bodies in front of these very important white artworks, as if they now have transcended and become the power dynamic here. They can actually buy the artwork. Even where, remember, Beyonce calls herself Queen Bee. So we have this idea of Queen Bee that shows up. Here we have Josephine crowning Beyonce as the part of Josephine right here. So it's quite brilliant. Remember, Rats and Medusa, we have an African individual on the top that was a slave or likely a slave and had little to lose. And here, when he raps, he raps. So it's a particular idea to show kind of black power, black movement, black pride, pride in the modern day world. So look at that video, it's very well done. When you are a junior, I highly recommend at some point, whether you're going to the Louvre or any of these other museums, travel. Your financial aid and they will go with you. Travel makes you more interesting. It makes you much more interesting. And so travel, travel, travel. Travel is actually fairly cheap when you're young. And so if you can go and stay at a hostel, a hostel will be less than $30 a night in most parts of the world. And breakfast will be included. You'll have a hot shower. You'll have a place to store your luggage that actually has a, um, a lovely lock on it. You can leave for a couple of days, come back, you stay in mixed gender or in single gender rooms, that's up to you. And if you take enough lunch, enough food, you can actually have lunch as well. It's a very interesting way to travel. And it does make the idea of the places you go. The first time I ever met Angelina Jolie at a, at a gathering, she came up to me. And that is because I had just come back from Machu Picchu. And in Machu Picchu, which she was planning on going, she wanted to know, was it kid friendly? How did I do it? Did I do the entire walking trip? And so it was remarkable because in every aspect, oh, the place you'll go, this is what makes you more interesting. So here's my little guys. This is our passion. This is what I do. You know, I drive a car that has 220,000 miles on it. My wife has a car that has 210,000. We don't spend our money on the flashy stuff that shows up. We spend it on the quality of life, the things, the experiences we can do, whether that's living in an African village where my wife and daughter here are learning an African dance amongst the Maasai in Tanzania, whether it's hiking Mount Fuji, we were the only white people up there, whether it's going and walking parts of the Great Wall of China when we were in China. Travel, and this is what Mark Twain says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Once you go and actually learn and get to stay with people and experience them and really take it on from a more, from a cultural perspective that they are taking, you will learn that people around the world almost invariably have common concerns and very different responses to those concerns based upon the amount of money, based upon the topography, based upon the climate that they live in. Um, it's pretty remarkable. These individuals want the same thing for their children as I want for my daughter, a better life a way of doing and following and pursuing her dreams that's fiscally available for her to live a happy life. They want that child to have the exact same experiences. It's just a matter of what does their culture provide in order for that to happen? What do they invest in? And we have some of those same issues as well. We'll come back and talk about that then for the know. So lastly, what are the impacts that romantic arts have had on our world today? How does romantic art and the depictions that we see from the odalisks to the horrific images, to the cannibalism and challenging of the government authority, to the idea of looking at someone who's going mentally unstable, to the idea of the horrors of your government and challenging a government or a dominating power. How do those things impact the world that we live in today? And that is romanticism. Thank you very much and have a wonderful night. Bye. <laughs>